During the late 1700s to mid-1800s, England and America underwent a massive transformation from agricultural economies into industrial economies. This period, which saw the invention of hundreds of new machines and products changing our landscape and our way of life, is known as the Industrial Revolution. In 1793, Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin in the United States. The cotton gin was a machine that made harvesting cotton easier and faster, quickly separating the seeds from the cotton fiber. From there, the raw cotton was sent to a cotton mill. Cotton mills were large factories where cotton was spun into fabric that could be used for clothing. The machinery used in the cotton mills was developed from an early device called the spinning jenny. With the invention of the sewing machine in 1846, it was now possible to produce clothing quickly and efficiently in bulk. With this new streamlined process, products were now available more readily than ever before, but this convenience came at a price. The new machines required fuel to run, and that fuel put pollution in the air. The clear, clean skies of agricultural America were blackened with the new smokestacks of the big cities. To find the fuel and manufacture the machines, men worked long and hard in the coal mines and iron foundries. Smoke and dust got in their lungs, and many men got sick and died as a result of this labor. Young children were often employed to operate the machinery, spending long, grueling hours at work in terrible conditions at the factories, usually receiving very little pay. Many historians believe that the invention of the cotton gin also led to an increase in slavery in the United States. It was a time not only of great innovation, but also of exploitation. Eventually, slavery was abolished. Laws were made to prevent child labor and unsafe working conditions, and more inventions followed, such as Alexander Graham Bell's telephone in 1876, and the Model T Ford, first produced on an assembly line in 1913. The inventions of the Industrial Revolution launched us into a new age and have helped billions of people across the world. But the means by which they are made have also made life difficult and unhappy for many. All right, a little short little video there, of course, uh, on the Industrial Revolution, which, of course, I'll be talking a lot about this week, of course, uh, week 10, of course, uh, BRCC. So hope you all are having a great week out there. OK, <clears throat> of course, I uh, hope you all had a great weekend uh, as well. Uh, this week, I'll be kind of continuing talking about the 19th century. I'm um, going to talk about the rise of Industrial Revolution, of course, industrialization, uh, socialism. But later in the week, I'll get into uh, and also talk about the rise of nationalism. And I'm also going to spend a little time uh, talking about a lot about the um, rise of imperialism uh, that was also big uh, in the 1800s. So I hope you all had a great weekend out there. Uh, of course, you know, we're close to, you know, I guess the home stretch. We only got a few weeks, of course, left of classes. I think lecture-wise, I've only got maybe four weeks left uh, overall. Uh, so I know next week I'll be moving on. Uh, to get into like the 20th century, you know, historical topics. Uh, right now, it looks like we've got a few students watching live right now. I know we have Melva watching this morning. So I hope you're having a great morning. Uh, Ziang Pu is also watching uh, as well. Kiera, uh, hey, good morning. Uh, Olivia, Paige, uh, Grayson, good morning. Uh, Christine, and also Chelsea. Uh, also, Madison's watching, of course, uh, in StreamYard uh, as well. Uh, if you want to join me in streamyard.com here, of course, is the link uh, below uh, right here. Now, I did want to talk about a few assignments that you'll have this week. Um, I think we've got uh, pretty much uh, the British quiz, uh, which has been up for a while. That's going to close tonight. So if you have not done it yet, uh, I need to wrap that up uh, for that assignment. I did leave your vocab open, the second one. I'll uh, probably give give you this week to turn it in if you still want to do that. Uh, if you're kind of behind on that, you need to get that to me uh, for points. But I'll leave it up this week if you want to turn that in. Uh, there's also this bonus video quiz I put up uh, on uh, the Devil's Island uh, penal colony that was established by the Second French Empire under Emperor Napoleon III. Uh, that's up, too, which will be up for a while uh, if you want extra credit 
for that assignment uh, as well. Uh, later in the week, I'll have also uh, the second exam coming, of course, uh, which is going to primarily be, of course, on French Revolution, Age of Napoleon, and of course, the 19th century topics we're talking about this week and prior to last week uh, as well. So I'll talk more about that later in the week and, of course, send out announcements about that uh, as well. So anyway, uh, like I said, we're going to, of course, move on today uh, to talk about the, uh, you know, the industrialization, which really takes off in the 1800s. Uh, I'll kind of, we kind of goes back before that, of course, uh, back to the 18th century, but I'll kind of talk about that uh, as well. I'll also touch a little bit for a few minutes uh, on the rise of socialism, which really starts in the 1800s, but doesn't really take off until the 20th century. You know, with communism and all that that you have later. So if you have any comments, questions about this lecture uh, during the live stream, you know, let me know. Or you can always leave me comments later on my channel. You can also subscribe to my channel as well if you want uh, as well. So anyway, like I said, we'll talk about, of course, the background uh, of industrialization, uh, which, yeah, 19th century, you know, you really get all these countries start to get industrialized, especially in Europe and uh, North America, but uh, industrialization really goes back before that. It really started uh, in the 18th century, and you get this case where it helps to create a lot of economic booms uh, throughout a lot of countries, like Britain becomes, you know, uh, the biggest empire in the world uh, because of its economies, uh, that not just in, you know, Britain or whatever, uh, but worldwide uh, as well. I think Napoleon once remarked that the British was like the workshop of the world uh, at the time, and uh, and really um, you're gonna you're gonna start to see at the wrong slide there. Just realize it. You're gonna start to see really the industrial revolution start uh, in places like Britain, uh, Western Europe, uh, and also spreads to the rest of the world uh, in general. Uh, and um, you'll see this transition that takes place where. Uh, in the world, you start to see the development of like machines and inventions that they were talking about in that little short video. So you start seeing that uh, chemical iron production uh, also occurs uh, as well. Uh, steam power, water power, electric power, uh, those kind of things uh, start to come about uh, as well. Uh, use of machine production, factories, machine tools, those kind of things uh, start to really industrialize a lot of these uh, countries throughout the world starts in Britain spreads to Western Europe like France you know Germany uh, etc uh, North America like the United States uh, into like Japan India uh, by the time you get up into like the 19th 20th centuries uh, as well so yeah all kinds of things that you start seeing and these are kind of examples of innovations that were you know pretty much prevalent uh, in the industrial Industrial Revolution, steel making processes, mass production, assembly lines. That's a big thing. Assembly lines, of course, is something you really start to see by the late 19th, uh, early 20th centuries. Electrical grid systems as well, large scale manufacturing of machine tools, uh, use, use of increasingly advanced machinery. You start seeing those kinds of technologies that really start to come about uh, in the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the Industrial Revolution is really divided into two uh, historical phases. Uh, usually they have the uh, first phase, which is often called the so-called First Industrial Revolution, which starts in the 18th century, and it goes up to sometime in the mid-19th uh, century. It's kind of debated about when it ends, but maybe 1850 is possibly where it ends. Uh, Britain, pretty much like England, Scotland, those were the first areas of the world to really get industrialized. Uh, and then from there it spread. You have the so-called second industrial revolution that goes from like around the mid 19th century up to like around World War I, like maybe up to about 1914, uh, et cetera. But then it hops over to the Americas, you know, like the United States, et cetera. Uh, also uh, parts of Western, Eastern Europe also start to industrialize. Parts of Asia, you know, the British going into India, help industrialize that area uh, as well. 
And then like Japan and other areas of the world also in Asia become industrialized uh, as well. So those are all different uh, influences, historical periods of the industrial revolution that really start getting going. A lot of it goes back to the 1700s. It wasn't really just the 19th century where you start to see industrialization uh, at that point. Uh, I'm going to kind of get into a little background about Britain, how they uh, first industrialized. Uh, one of the first things you start to see really is something that's the so-called British agricultural revolution that really takes off, they think, around 16, 1700s uh, in like England and other areas of Britain. And um, they think that the uh, British uh, agricultural revolution peaked between like the 17, 1800s, so 18th to about the 19th centuries. They think that was a major cause of why Britain became an industrialized nation uh, uh, because of the agricultural changes that were advanced uh, throughout the country. And they had this thing that was called the enclosure movement, which you can see there, where the land was enclosed. Uh, originally, it was you know divided up into many plots uh, throughout, say, England. And uh, what happened was, uh, going back to medieval times, they had this thing called the open field system they had, uh, which uh, was the typical type of agriculture that was done uh, back in the Middle Ages. And they went away from that. Uh, I think a lot of that was due to like population changes and so on. And so they began to enclose the land into larger style farms uh, overall. And so what that did was the large, larger farms forced adoption of better agricultural practices, uh, which cut down, by the way, on labor costs, labor and farm costs. And so that created like a surplus. They think of workers that were employed later in the industrialized cities that will be, you know, later like in countries like Britain, et cetera. So uh, they think the agricultural changes uh, led to this later. So one, larger farms you see there, uh, more efficient farms. Uh, they didn't need all the labor. Uh, and so that led to urbanization where all the workers were forced to go, you know, live in the cities uh, and find work. And that's where these industries, you know, find all the workers uh, they get in the end. Uh, it also led to like scientific farming, of course, uh, where they develop like new te techniques and practices uh, to, you know, farm uh, new kinds of technologies and inventions were, you know, developed, you know, by the 18th century. Uh, mechanized equipment, fertilizers, chemicals, those kind of things were used uh, in agriculture. Uh, selective breeding, they start doing this with a lot of cattle. Uh, and there's even like new forms of crop rotation systems that start to come in uh, as well uh, into um, making changes that led to the agricultural revolution. Uh, usually I talk about examples of, of the agricultural revolution. You have Jethro Tull, you may have heard about him. Uh, he was a famous uh, English farmer. Uh, who they think developed one of the first uh, practical ways to farm, uh, which was the so-called seed drill. Uh, the seed drill was a type of machine uh, that could basically plant, you know, seed uh, in the ground uh, mechanically. And they think that uh, Jethro Tull was one of the first to really influence the beginning of the agricultural revolution. He also had this mechanical hoe that he invented uh, as well. They think that Jethro Tull was one of the first to uh, try to get the, um, I guess, farmers to use like uh, manure and other things to grow crops better. So Jethro Tull was considered really the, one of the first major farmers that really starts to kind of improve agriculture uh, in places like England uh, at the time. Uh, there's another picture of Jethro Tull. And that's his, I guess, his seed drill uh, that's on the right uh, that you're looking at. But um, they also have other things like the uh, crop rotation systems was another thing that uh, was also kind of something that was vital uh, that led to a lot of farming changes uh, as well. Uh, the Norfolk course, uh, yeah, the Norfolk four course system, it, it used a, ro it, they, they rotated like what they call fodder crops uh, with their main crops. And this was done to restore uh, like the, the soil and, um, they used different kinds of 
spider crops. Like I think turnips was one, you know, that was a big one that was pushed by this man named Charles Townsend, uh, who you see uh, on the right uh, in that picture. Uh, and um, Town Townsend, I think I've got another of him right here, Townsend right here. Uh, but it would help replenish the replenish the, the soil, you know, for other crops uh, later. Uh, so turnips is one they used. Uh, clover, alfalfa were other kinds of crops. Uh, anything, I guess, that you could feed cattle uh, in general. And um, then, of course, the manure from the, the actual cattle would help to, you know, make the field even better uh, to create more output uh, of the fields. Uh, and so um, you can see how they would just rotate the crops with, you know, wheat and barley or other crops and then have the fodder crops rotated there as well. So um, before they just, I think they had a deal in, I know back in the open field system where they would just let a field lay fallow and not use it. And so this way it was kind of used, you know, for something, whether it was to feed cattle or whatever. Um, each field had some kind of use to it uh, overall. So anyway, that's that's Turnip Townsend, of course, uh, the guy that kind of influenced that idea of like a four field type crop rotation system. Uh, also, you get into like mechanical stuff kind of in being invented, uh, especially when you get up to like the 19th century. Uh, I've got John Deere, of course, you've probably heard of, uh, American farm equipment manufacturer. Uh, he's pretty important. Uh, he's, he's big because uh, he, he was one of the first to mass produce plows in the 1800s uh, to, you know, try to grow crops in America. Uh, I think iron plows and later steel plows, of course. Uh, and then later he would also develop like cultivators, combines, and of course tractors, which uh, obviously is one of the most famous things uh, that John Deere uh, is famous for. And of course, a lot of their machines were, of course, painted green. Uh, as you know. So yeah, that that new kinds of machines being invented to make farming practices easier. Uh, also, there's another uh, figure named Cyrus McCormick. He's big uh, as well. Uh, McCormick was another American farm equipment manufacturer uh, up in Chicago. Uh, he developed an international harvest company, which mass produced a lot of the first mechanical reapers, uh, which I think were originally pulled by horses and later by like tractor-like machines. Uh, and so uh, his his machines were uh, pretty big later. He also built tractors uh, as well, like you see there. His were red, you know. And so, yeah, a lot of these companies create competition, which helps to produce better farming equipment, by the way, uh, to make farming more practical over time. They start using things like, you know, um, you know, you get selective breeding. That's another thing that was also big uh, in agriculture as well, uh, where Robert Bakewell in the 18th century started to, you know, invent better ways to, you know, breed animals or crossbreed animals uh, to produce better livestock and more livestock uh, as well. Uh, and so that that helps to be also a way to create a lot of boom there. Like I know in Britain, uh, sheep sheep raising was big because of because of the production of wool uh, and things like that uh, as well. Fertil fertilizers are big too, you know, later too because of superphosphates and other chemicals that are used, you know, for fertilizers and stuff like that. Now I'm going to get into I'm going to talk a little bit about you know the industrial revolution because uh, inventions are really a big thing that really led to why the industrial revolution. Uh, occurred. Uh, some of the early in industries that were big, uh, if you really look into it, uh, are, uh, you know, textiles was like the first one I'll kind of talk about that was really the big industry that was, you know, that really boomed, but a lot of it was due to like population booms uh, in general. But uh, the iron steel industry was big. Uh, coal mining, uh, ship building was also big. Uh, and then also later, by the end of the 19th century, you start to get like into like the oil industry, like petroleum and things like that, uh, replace like whale oil, and stuff like that. Kerosene, gasoline, diesel, uh, you know, uh, et cetera, will be big industries, of course, uh, as well. Uh, let me talk about some inventions that were, of course, big 
uh, in the Industrial Revolution. I want to first talk about John Kay uh, in the textile industry. Uh, this one you're looking at is the so-called flying shuttle. Uh, it was considered really one of the first major inventions of the textile industry. Uh, this particular invention was invented around 1733 by this Englishman named John Kay, who I think was originally a watchmaker. Uh, and uh, anyway, um, this new machine he built uh, really uh, advanced uh, the textile industry. It cut time in half, uh, so it, it really saved time in the production of cloth uh, to making clothes. And then you only needed one person instead of maybe two or whatever uh, to uh, make cloth. Uh, and uh, it was controversial when it came out because uh, a lot of these machines later uh, put a lot of people out of, out of business, like women would work at home spinning cloth with spinning wheels and things like that. Uh, but this is going to make it more into like factories uh, later. Uh, so they consider that one to be really the first major invention uh, that really industrialized the textile industry uh, overall. Uh, there was another invention by uh, James Hargreaves. He's an Englishman uh, as well. He invented the uh, spinning jenny. Uh, and um, spinning jenny was a multi multiple spindle weaving frame. That's, I think, the common term that they use for it. It also industrialized uh, the whole textile industry uh, as well. It's one of the first to incorporate a spinning wheel with it, which they say that Hargreaves got the idea uh, from seeing a spinning wheel. Uh, and so he decided to add that to a machine. Uh, and the name was named after Jenny, who was his wife. So spinning Jenny, uh, hence the name. And uh, this one was like way faster. It was six to eight times faster than the flying shuttle. Uh, you can see, I think there were some later that were even faster than that that would produce cloth uh, as well. Uh, but they had this, of course, famous uh, uh, man named Richard Arkwright. Uh, he was more into the later part of the 18th century, uh, would develop what they call the water frame. Uh, the water frame was uh, considered one of the most advanced uh, looms, I guess, to produce cloth uh, at the time. It was invented in 1769. And uh, what's interesting about um, Arkwright, they, they consider Arkwright to be the father of the textile industry, especially in England. And it's because of the fact that Arkwright was one of the first to produce textile mills. He built these textile mills in England uh, where they started producing cloth around the 1770s. And um, kind of shows some images here. And uh, there was this one um, textile mill. It's called Derwent Valley Mills, which is in Derbyshire, England. That was supposedly the first textile mill ever built in the world uh, in the 18th century. Like 1770s, I think, is when it was built. Uh, and um, so his factory started producing a, a lot of cloth, uh, which like wool and later cotton uh, as well. Uh, and um, a lot of these uh, factories will eventually use like, they'll employ like uh, water wheels uh, for, their, for their, you know, textile industries and mills and other things like that, that they use it for. And uh, this was the main turbine that would, you know, produce the electrical power that they would need uh, to run their machines. Uh, and so a lot of factories had to be built near like rivers or whatever, uh, large size streams. Uh, and um, they think that the water wheel or water turbine has been around. It you know goes back to uh, the time of the, um, I think, ancient times and middle ages. It's kind of been around. They start using it, you know, in modern times, of course, a lot as well. Uh, they have some other inventions, like Samuel Crompton uh, in, in the 17, late 1770s invented this invention called the spinning mule. Uh, it was kind of this hybrid version that was kind of a combination of the spinning jenny uh, and uh, also the water frame. And uh, it was a very popular machine. In fact, I think they say this was one of the most popular uh, textile looms that was built uh, around the 18th century, which was used into the 1800s. And uh, it was called a, called, called a spinning mule because it was a hybrid of two, two other inventions. So obviously inventions start to influence other inventions and things like that uh, as well. <clears throat> and then uh, the other invention that was, of course, the one that became really more famous, though, especially by the 19th century, was the so-called power loom, uh, which 
Edmund Cartwright invented 1785. And uh, they consider that one to be really the most uh, efficient one ever built. Uh, first, a lot of them were steam powered, and then later they were electrical power uh, as well. And um, this is the one that, that, of course, is used the most in Britain and other countries later, and it's still used today. The power loom is still around. A lot of these other textile looms that you see, you know, I kind of showed you, a lot of them are still around. And they're still used. I know in Asia, they use a lot of these different machines uh, still today. Uh, of course, they always talk about Eli Whitney, which they were kind of mentioning a lot, of course, in that little short video. Uh, he invented the cotton gin uh, in 1793. Uh, that was considered a very important invention, believe it or not, uh, because uh, before that, the cotton industry was declining. Uh, they, they couldn't figure out how to use it because the fact that it was just so expensive to remove cotton seed uh, from the cotton bowl. And then uh, Whitney invented this uh, invention that would remove the cotton seeds mechanically. Uh, and so that, that made the, the production of cloth become viable uh, after that. And so by the 19th century, cotton became king, you know, uh, and all that. Uh, however, you see it, obviously, it, it influenced the increase, increasing of slavery, like, say, in the United States. Uh, and so they think that was a contributing factor that led to the American Civil War in the 1860s. Uh, but, but obviously, cotton is one of the main types of cloths that's used today uh, by most people that, that wear it. And most of the cloth we get, like cotton cloth anywhere, cotton, uh, comes from predominantly Egypt or India. I think in China uh, as well. So, yeah, and I think uh, Whitney was this uh, industrialist that uh, developed, like, uh, interchangeable parts for, like, muskets and guns. Uh, and then he invented this cotton gin. I think it was from New England. And I think he didn't make much money off of it in the end, <clears throat> I believe. So it's, it's kind of an interesting invention there. <clears throat> Here's another uh, large size image, of course, of a cotton gin uh, that you're looking at. Now, I did want to get into and talk about some of the important inventions that especially were in the first industrial revolution uh, in the 18th and 19th centuries. So uh, there's one invention you see on the right bottom there and right here uh, that was really big uh, overall. That was the so-called steam engine, which <clears throat> the one that's the most famous one is the Watt steam engine or Watt engine uh, that came out. And uh, Watt was a Scottish engineer uh, and inventor. And uh, <clears throat> he invented the uh, Watt steam engine from actually another invention that had been around, which was called the New Comet engine. I don't know if you know much about uh, steam engines. Uh, they were originally used, steam engine was originally used in coal mines uh, to try to remove water from the bottom of a coal mine. And this man named Thomas Newcomen in England invented this engine called the new engine in 1712. And what it would do is it would it would convert water to steam and uh, remove it from the coal mine, bring it up to the surface, basically. Uh, but the machine was apparently impractical. It would break down a lot. And so Watt, Watt came along uh, and uh, advanced, you know, a better version of it. And you can see on the right, that's a blueprint uh, of uh, his steam engine. Uh, that he would patent in 1769. And he, by the way, became very wealthy off of this invention because uh, they say that the steam engine was the greatest invention uh, of the first industrial revolution, uh, especially around the 18th century. So it revolutionized like other fields, like in the industrial revolution, uh, et cetera. Uh, here's a, a large mock-up, of course, of the Watt steam engine uh, the early steam engine did not have a lot of horsepower. I forget the number, but it may have had 80 horsepower or something like that. The future ones will have, you know, probably 7,000 uh, horsepower uh, to them <clears throat> overall. And uh, a lot of them, of course, burned like things like coal, you know, to you know, make them uh, run, uh, which worked on a, like a boiler system, uh, basically. So yeah, the Watt the Watt steam engine was considered to be really one of the best you know inventions really at that time, and so it, it later revolutionized other areas. So you get into like you know you get into naval stuff 
uh, as well, like steamships and things like that. Uh, and you got Robert Fulton here, uh, of course, an image of him uh, with one of the first uh, commercial steamships that was invented uh, called the Claremont. Claremont, it was called. It's called the Claremont, but it also had two different names. They originally called it the North River Steamboat or Steamship. Uh, and uh, it was a type of um, vessel that he built in 1807, which operated on the Hudson River, uh, like in the New York area. And so that was considered the first, you know, practical uh, steamship that was built, uh, which used like a type of steam engine. And you can see in the middle, it has like a like a paddle wheel uh, that ran it. Uh, and so that that invention uh, was really that would really, you know, totally revolutionize, you know, sailing. Uh, you'll go into the age of sail will kind of come to an end eventually with the because of the steamship uh, that gets, of course, invented. Uh, also, they think that Fulton invented one of the first submarines that was built in 1800 called the Nautilus. Uh, and um, I think originally Fulton was building these uh, submersibles or submarines uh, to sell them to uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, who was fighting against the British, the British you know, Navy. And he thought that might be a way to kind of counter them. Uh, and uh, you can see that it employed like a propeller on the back. And that's something you'll see later with a lot of ships uh, by mid to late 19th century uh, will be, of course, have propellers. Uh, then, of course, the locomotive. Don't forget, uh, that's another thing that was advanced, too, uh, because of the steam steam engine as well. Uh, Richard Trevithick uh, was a British engineer that built one of the first uh, steam engine, steam, steam, uh, really high pressure steam engine locomotive, uh, steam, that steam locomotive as they call it for short. And uh, he, he built one in uh, 1804 uh, that was called Catch Me Who Can. <clears throat> and so uh, that began the so-called age of the iron horse, uh, which is what they called uh, the 19th century later. Uh, because of the fact that all these industrialized na nations like Britain and others uh, began to develop railroads all throughout their country to link up different cities and expand their economies. Uh, and so they think the locomotive plays a you know major role in, in that reason for that. Uh, Catch Me You Can, by the way, uh, only you can see it only went six miles per hour. Uh, they call it an iron horse, by the way, uh, because... Uh, it was made of iron, and it was equivalent to a speed of maybe close to a horse horse's speed. But early ones, even like Catch Me You Can, uh, could pull 25 tons, which is pretty good. Uh, for that time, you can see it ran on iron rails, and then later they'll develop steel rails uh, as well. Uh, they had this other man named George Stevenson. You may have heard of him. Uh, he was this Englishman uh, that built the first... Uh, major railroad in the world, uh, which was built in Britain, and it was called the Liverpool and Manchester Railway. It was completed in 1830, uh, which linked up those two cities uh, in, like, a southern England. And um, Stevenson is sometimes called the father of the railways uh, because of that, because uh, he invented that, and also the standard gauge, which I'll talk about, which is a type of type of rail gauge that they invented uh, with the railroads. And um, See here uh, an example, of course, of like locomotives being used. That's the actual, I think, original Liverpool and Manchester Railway uh, that you're looking at on the left uh, right there. Uh, his would employ what they call the standard gauge rail. The standard gauge rail uh, is a type of typical system of rails, which has about, um, I think the typical length is four foot, eight and a half inches, uh, which you see there. Uh, on second to the bottom, and um, or if you want the um, millimeters, it's fourteen hundred thirty. Yeah, fourteen hundred thirty-five mil millimeters uh, is the length uh, between it. And I'll put it on the screen for you. The so-called standard gauge. They also call it the Stevenson gauge uh, as well. Uh, they also have the narrow gauge uh, as well above, which is sometimes used or variations of it, like around two feet or so. Uh, so you can see the differences that are used on, with rail systems throughout the world. 
I think about two thirds of railroads uh, pretty much use the standard gauge system uh, that they have, uh, which I think this is kind of an example of the standard gauge with right here. Uh, also, uh, I think they were talking about this little uh, locomotive on the, that you see in that image, the rocket, which was built in 1829. That was considered to be the first major locomotive that was constructed, which was built by uh, George Stevenson's son, Robert Stevenson. Uh, the two were kind of like a father's son uh, that developed a lot of the early uh, railroad industry in England. And... Um, Supposedly that particular locomotive you see in that image was the type of prototype uh, locomotive that other uh, locomotives copied off of. And that's why it's like important uh, today uh, overall. Now also, uh, you know, like, like I said, at first they ran them on iron rails, but what's going to happen is that they're going to eventually go to steel, the production of steel uh, in um one of the men that really helped to do that was a man named Henry Bessemer. Uh, Bessemer was this English steel manufacturer that developed some of the first mass-produced cheap steel uh, in the world, uh, which he began doing in the 1850s. And he did it through a process that they call now the so-called Bessemer process or Bessemer conversion, uh, where uh, they would mass produce steel by converting molt, molten pig iron into steel uh, using carbon. Uh, and uh, it's sometimes called carburizing is what they call is the term that they use for it. And so uh, the development of the steel industry became very big. Uh, it, of course, helps to really, uh, it helps to really revolutionize a lot of different industries, uh, not just, you know, warfare later as well, but developing of skyscrapers, bridges, railroads, automobiles, uh, things like that. Anything that's made out of iron and steel, of course, uh, it helped to obviously, you know, influence it. Uh, they think that uh, Bessemer Steel uh, was influenced, uh, influenced uh, Andrew Carnegie, who was a Scottish-American uh, that went, went to England and saw what Bessemer was doing and brought it back uh, to America. And... Um, Andrew Carnegie would help develop, of course, the American steel industry, which he started, you know, you know about this Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And uh, he would later sell his steel company, which would become later what they call U.S. Steel Corporation, which was one of the largest corporations, one of the first major ones to really be founded at that time. I think it was the first billion dollar corporation. Uh, here's a Bessemer converter. Uh, by the way, to uh, melt like iron and you know to make steel out of it, 2,861 degrees Fahrenheit that you have to basically melt melt iron. So very high temperatures, of course, uh, to uh, make make you know steel. Now I'm going to move on. I'm going to also talk about other inventions that impacted modern times. Uh, especially uh, the second industrial revolution. I'll get into that uh, the most today and talk about that. Uh, of course, one of the big things you really start to see by the mid to late 19th century was telecommunications inventions uh, that really revolutionized uh, things in the world. So uh, the, the real big ones were, uh, if you know about this, the telegraph, of course, you know, magnetic telegraph, uh, the development of the telephone, uh, and the wireless radio. So I think those are the three biggest ones that they'll have uh, overall. Uh, you see Samuel Morse there, of course, in the middle on the right. Uh, he, of course, was one of the major inventors uh, in America that developed the you know, telegraph around 1832. Uh, supposing Morse was one of the first uh, to send a telegraph message, uh, which was done on May 24th. 1844, Moore sent this uh, telegraph message, said, what hath God wrought, basically. Uh, and so uh, from there, you know, Europe and America, uh, telegraphs start to be used uh, for telecommunications. I think the first wars that they used it in were like the Crimean War, uh, the American Civil War. Uh, they start using telegraphs and things like that. 
And actually, you get Western Union. You may have heard of them. Uh, Western Union was one of the first corporations uh, to monopolize it, uh, the telegraph industry. I think they say Western Union was the first corporation, actually, in the world. Uh, they're, they're the ones that monopolized it pretty much uh, for a long time. Uh, then you got Marconi, Guglielmo Marconi, you see there. And also, right, uh, that, of course, there's an image of Samuel Morse. That's the original telegraph <clears throat> with the actual Morse code alphabet. Uh, dot, uh, dot and dashes, of course, used, of course, uh, for that system. I don't know if they use it as much anymore, but it was big in the 19th and into the early 20th century. But Marconi... Um, He's important, too. Uh, Marconi was an Italian-American uh, who came to the United States uh, around the 1890s, uh, and he developed this uh, company that became known as the Marconi Wireless uh, tele Telegraph Company. Uh, and uh, he was one of the first to really take advantage of wireless radio uh, that was uh, kind of being pioneering uh, in the early 19th century. And they figured out that they could send you know, <clears throat> wireless messages via radio waves. <clears throat> so that's something that he helped to invent. And um, so you, you get to start seeing that occurring late 19th, uh, early 20th century. And that also led to uh, the development of like, you know, radio. Uh, of course, something you'll see uh, by the early 20th century uh, as well. Uh, there, of course, is, a, um, uh, yeah, 1903. That was when they sent the first transatlantic wireless message where uh, supposedly Teddy Roosevelt, who was president at the time, sent a uh, wireless message to uh, the King of Britain, uh, King Edward VII in London. Uh, and so that began the whole, you know, wireless messages being sent, of course. I think if you uh, sent one through Marconi's company, it was called a Marconi Graham, so they called it. Uh, usually I talk about Nikola Tesla as well. Tesla was pretty big uh, as well. Uh, he was a Serbian and American inventor uh, who was predominantly an electrical and also a mechanical engineer. But you know about him, uh, he's more known for doing a lot of patents uh, that deal with like, like electri electricity, uh, electrical supply, uh, and um, Tesla was the one uh, that pop, pop, made popular the idea of using what they call alternating current uh, as the main electrical supply. And uh, he, he, if you know about this, Tesla originally worked for Thomas Edison in his uh, electric company. He and, he and um, uh, Edison got the loggerheads. And uh, Edison wanted uh, what they call direct current. And Tesla wanted alternating current, and so he left. He left uh, Edison's company, and he went to work for uh, a man named George Westinghouse, uh, who had the Westinghouse Electric Company. And it's that company that really starts to kind of control the electrical supply. And they start using what they call alternating current. But I know in the late 19th century they had this thing called the current wars, current wars, uh, where they couldn't decide whether they should use direct current or alternating current, uh, but alternating current in the end proved to be more safer, uh, basically to be used. So of course they have Tesla cars, you know, now named after them and all that, uh, which I guess is a famous electric car they have now. <clears throat> uh, of course, Alexander Graham Bell, uh, he's also big uh, in telecommunications uh, as well. Uh, Bell was a, a Canadian uh, that uh, came to America uh, Philadelphia in, in the late 19th century. And of course, you see in 1876, he would patent one of the first telephones. Uh, you see there, uh, the telephone industry was pretty important as a telecommunications uh, invention. Uh, I think everybody's got a telephone now. Uh, but when Bell invented it in 1876, he had the only one. <laughs> like, I think that and his assistant, you know about him, uh, Mr. Watson, uh, and, um, yeah, for a while, they only had the two telephones in the world. It was kind of weird uh, about that. Uh, but he would go on to monopolize uh, the telephone company, uh, telephone industry, uh, so-called Bell Telephone Company, 
uh, which was founded right afterwards. And um, it became such a monopoly that they had to break it up, uh, if you know about that uh, later. So, yeah, telephone. It's interesting about the telephone. The telephone was actually this invention uh, that Bell uh, supposedly created originally to help out deaf children so they could hear, like, I guess, in class and all that. Uh, and so they realized that they could use it for a telecommunications device uh, overall. Uh, of course, they've got the, the airplane. I think everybody's heard about that. That's a very important invention that really revolutionized transportation, uh, especially with the aviation industry, uh, later warfare uh, as well. Uh, they were invented by these two brothers, Orville and Wilbur Wright. Uh, who were actually bicycle mechanics. They actually owned a bicycle shop uh, in Ohio. Uh, and uh, anyway, they heard about gliders. And so the Wright brothers decided to build gliders to see if they could learn how to fly. Uh, people thought they were crazy when they, of course, invented a lot of these early flyers. And eventually they put like propellers on it with, with you know, machines. Uh, and uh, they realized they could fly, fly different you know, machines with that. And so, um, yeah, the first plane flown you see there is the so-called Wright Flyer 1, I think they call it sometimes, which was flown at Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, on the east coast of North Carolina in December of 1903. And so uh, the Wright brothers were the first to really uh, fly. <clears throat> and um, they had other ones, too. They had the Wright Flyer 2, I think they built later. Uh, 1903. I think it was the Wright Flyer 3 uh, as well. It had several of these variations. Uh, and so you start to see it kind of starting to look more like an airplane later, which a lot of the early airplanes were like biplanes. And I think the Germans even did like triplanes and stuff like that. Uh, and so it'll really help to revolutionize um, the aviation industry, et cetera. Uh, then you got the automobile, if you know about this of course, which the automobile was something that was invented in the 19th century. We went back to the 1800s. Uh, they think that the, uh, you know about it, Mercedes-Benz was the first to really develop, uh, you know, automobiles uh, like in Europe. Uh, and then uh, you see here, uh, I always talk about Henry Ford. Uh, Henry Ford uh, and his uh, Ford Motor Company, they were the first to really mass produce automobiles by the millions. Uh, which one of the first uh, that they built was called the Ford Model T. <clears throat> it was considered the first major <clears throat> mass-produced automobile in the world. And you can see between 1909 and 1927, uh, they produced 27 million <clears throat> Model Ts. It's a lot. So that's more than uh, 1 million a year when you're looking at right there. And uh, they were called Tin Lizzie because um, they're kind of like almost like a tin can on wheels. But it was like a cheap automobile that um, only cost <clears throat> under $1,000 uh, at the time. And uh, the old joke about <clears throat> the Model T was that you could, um, I think when they first built it, they, they said that you could buy it in any color as long as it's black. Because I think originally they painted cars just so they wouldn't rust. <laughs> uh, that's the 1927 Model T. So they started to get more advanced a lot of these automobiles and um one thing about the ford motor company uh it was one of the first to uh mass produce automobiles like using like an assembly line where men would work on different parts uh, of the car uh, that you're looking at and uh henry ford uh by 1914 he even started to pay his workers five dollars a day which at the time, early 19th, early 20th century, that was a lot of money uh, to be paid five dollars a day. You know, five dollars a day would be much now, uh, but back then it's a lot of money uh, for that time period. So, the automobile, the automobile really, you know, revolutionized uh, transportation. So you could go anywhere, you know, as long as they have roads, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and it even gave uh, not just men but women more independence as well. Uh, like in, say, the United States, as an example. Uh, usually I also talk about uh, another inventor, too, of course. There's more automobiles right there. 
Uh, you got Thomas Edison, uh, who they think a lot of people kind of consider to be one of the greatest inventors, really, of the whole industrial revolution. He probably invented more inventions than anybody else, uh, especially between the 19th and 20th centuries. And uh, Edison uh, was an American inventor uh, that had a workshop that was in New Jersey uh, called Menlo Park, Menlo Park, New Jersey. And so people later called him the uh, Wizard of Menlo Park. And you can see he had over 1,300 patents that he invented uh, at one point, uh, which the one on the right uh, you see uh, is really his most famous invention, uh, the incandescent light bulb, which lights had been around before that. Like in Europe, they already had lights and things like that, arc lights, I think they're called sometimes. Uh, but this is more of a practical light that you could use in your home. Uh, and so that would lead to later electric light power, like in cities like New York, which he helped to do uh, and things like that. Uh, these are things that he invented uh, besides, uh, obviously, the electric light bulb, which is his big invention. Uh, the kinetoscope uh, was a machine that he invented. Uh, it's kind of like this machine where you watch videos, uh, kind of like a camcorder. Uh, mimeograph is a type of machine which uh, made like kind of like a Xerox copy machine. It's an early version of it, uh, which he invented. Electric boat recorder, something he invented. Uh, the microphone, he invented the microphone, but you didn't know that, uh, which I'm speaking through. Uh, electric power and lights. Uh, New York City was one of the first, uh, to, the whole city to be lit up uh, by him. And he even had his own company that was called the Thomas Edison Electric Company, which later became General Electric, uh, which is around today. Automatic telegraph machine, uh, alkaline battery, uh, those are things he invented. Uh, also, the phonograph, he invented that, like an early version of it. And also the movie projector. Uh, they think that Edison was the one that led to Hollywood later, Hollywood movies uh, being made uh, later. Like I said, a lot, a lot of people thought his inventions were magic. And so they called him the Wizard of Menlo Park. And... Uh, you had these deals where uh, news, newspaper reporters would come to Edison and ask him, you know, about his inventions and to give him some little quotations that, that he could, you know, say that would kind of like how his inventions were made and things like that. I think the most famous one he said was like, the one I always liked anyway, he said, my inventions are 99% perspiration and 1% inspiration because a lot of the inventions were hard work. It wasn't magic at all, uh, his inventions. Uh, so uh, he had to find ways that, you know, the invention worked. Because a lot of times it didn't, things like that. He said, I didn't invent the battery. I invented ways not to invent the battery, you know, things like that. So just things like that <clears throat> as examples uh, with Edison uh, and his inventions. So really, you know, modernization of the world, things like that. Uh, Edison was really one of the first to really, of course, do that. Now, I'm going to also talk for a few minutes about the rise of socialism. That's that's something that you really start to see, you know, uh, in the in the 19th century is the development of socialism, uh, you know, which socialism was a, a movement in the 19th century where there was an attempt to try to improve uh, workers' conditions, because uh, workers, you know, really uh, didn't have a lot of rights overall. They couldn't unionize, uh, things like that. Uh, working conditions, by the way, uh, were also very horrible uh, as well. Uh, from the beginning, you know, the Industrial Revolution they had, you know, the workers' wages weren't very good. Uh, I think the average uh, skilled worker made somewhere between one to three dollars a day uh, to give you an idea so you know making five dollars a day like in ford's factory that was pretty good uh, but you didn't have any health insurance uh, no workers compensation no benefits existed uh, things like that uh, there were limited there had some workers unions but they were limited and they were considered illegal uh, things like that uh, at the top uh, but the working conditions, like i said were very bad you got hurt on the job they just kicked you out. They hired somebody else uh, to replace you. Uh, socialists basically advocated for complete control of the economy. 
So centralized government would be involved in planning or they would plan the economy, uh, which was either done by the government or done also by the people uh, as well, the workers, uh, that kind of thing. So that's the whole idea of, um, I guess, socialism, which was to have more control over the economy, uh, even over uh, private industry being controlled by the government or by the people uh, as well. Uh, of course, socialism is controversial because of communism. I'll get to that uh, a little later. Uh, but communism is something that kind of makes it unpopular uh, to some people. Uh, utopian socialism, that, that's really considered to be one of the earliest forms of socialism that really became popular uh, back in the 19th century. Uh, early socialism began in countries like France first. They think it was caused by the French Revolution. Uh, it also spread to England, uh, United States, I think in Germany uh, and other places as well. And uh, utopian socialism favored uh, living within like communes, like a farming community or even an industrial commune, uh, things like that. And uh, some people also call it uh, cooperative socialism. Uh, the only thing about the socialists was that they, they kind of considered everybody equal, but they weren't like the Marxists. Uh, the Marxists believed in like this idea of a class struggle between different social classes. They, they rejected that. But uh, it's still the utopian socialists and the later Marxists are still considered like radical type movements, of course, that started in the 19th century uh, overall. Uh, those are examples of early utopian socialists uh, that were kind of influential. Robert Owen, uh, who's an Englishman, uh, Charles Fourier uh, and Count St. Simon, uh, who were in France, uh, they were also influential, but they saw this idea that people could live together in harmony, everybody's equal. It's kind of like an egalitarian society where men and women uh, are equal and they kind of were involved in act actively planning the economy and things like that. Uh, they actually have deals where uh, they start even, you know, forming these industrial communes, like we're kind of talking about Robert Owen, uh, who I think you see on the right there. He developed actually this uh, industrial commune as an example in Indiana, Indiana in the United States uh, that was called uh, New Harmony. So you get these kind of different kinds of uh, communes that kind of developed uh, because of that. The United States had a lot of these. They had one called Brook Farm you may have heard of. And I know in New York, we had one that was called uh, the Oneida Society uh, as well. It kind of, it's kind of comparable to like the Amish, et cetera. You know, some of these communes where people are living together uh, is kind of an equal society. Uh, but Karl Marx, uh, they really see Marx as really the one that was the most influential uh, in the end. Uh, Marxism is going to replace uh, utopian socialism. It's going to eventually do that uh, by the mid, late uh, 19th century. And uh, Marxism, uh, which was named for Karl Marx, who was a German philosopher, uh, was basically based on what they call scientific socialism, where it was more of a study of economics and politics, and even history. Uh, and Marx was the pioneer of it. And Marx had you know, several books that were influential, uh, the most, of course, being uh, the Communist Manifesto, uh, who you've probably heard of. Uh, let, me, let me show you a little short video, of course, on Karl Marx, get a little background uh, on him and more about his life. Mark Twain is now thought of as America's first celebrity because he was so good at capturing the public imagination and it became important to him to have a public image. Yeah. Sure, go back. So anyway, yeah, that's a little part of the end I didn't need. need but anyway, oh uh, yeah, Karl Marx though, yeah. Uh, so a little background on him, a little short video from, of course, the History Channel. Now, uh, Marx, um, I'll kind of talk a little background about him. Uh, he, of course... Uh, was educated at different German uh, universities. Uh, and um, he was instrumental in writing several books. One of the, of course, the most famous uh, is the Communist Manifesto you see here uh, with, um, you see there with uh, Mark, Marx and e Marx uh, with Frederick Engels, uh, who he met in uh, England. And um, 
Communist Manifesto is really the book that was the most influential overall, especially with the development of communism later uh, by the 20th century. And uh, what um, the Communist Manifesto said uh, basically was that Marx believed that what would happen like over time uh, anyway, was that um, the capitalist system would decline. He thought it would decline, collapse, uh, and due to the different class struggles that were between uh, the various social classes, uh, which the um, upper classes uh, were what he called the capitalists. Uh, and then you had the uh, working class he called the proletariat. So these two separate classes that you had, I guess at Europe, Europe in most of Europe and Central Europe anyway, they didn't have a big middle class. You had you know the upper class and the lower class on uh, that kind of thing. The capitalist bourgeoisie came out of the upper middle class, though, to kind of take over from the nobility, you know, as, as absolutism began to decline. And then the workers are working for, like, wages. Uh, and so the difference between, obviously, industries making a lot of money is the amount of wages that you're paying them, uh, that kind of thing. Uh, and so Marx believed that because of a wealth gap in equities, uh, that eventually what's going to happen is that the workers will overthrow the capitalists and then develop eventually a type of socialist type system uh, is what would happen. Well, like I said through a workers' revolution is pretty much uh, what would happen. Uh, of course, the, the, the popular type of form of uh, socialism that really took off, especially in the 20th century, was Marxism-Leninism, uh, which you know took off in Russia uh, with the Soviet Union, which... Uh, politicians like Vladimir Lenin uh, help influence, uh, who were heavily influenced by Karl Marx's ideology. And so uh, you get get the Soviet Union was really the, the first socialist state that you really get uh, that forms uh, in 1922, uh, CCCP or USSR, uh, as they call it for short, uh, as well. Uh, the only thing different about communism is that the whole entire state is socialist. It doesn't really have any capitalism in it uh, that you have overall. And so it's a one-party state uh, where uh, they have a political party, but it's communist. It's totally socialist. There's no other political parties uh, have, as a whole. And so it's considered what they call a socialist republic, uh, more or less. Uh, there's a diff there's different lists of countries, of course. You know, the goal of socialism is communism, see there of course, Vladimir Lenin, but yeah, you've got different countries that will be socialist. You've got China uh, eventually will also become as well a communist state uh, overall, the People's Republic of China, uh, Vietnam, at first North Vietnam, and then all of Vietnam, of course, uh, as well uh, in the 1970s, uh, North Korea, uh, of course, 1948, uh, Cuba, 1961, uh, Laos for a while also was a communist state uh, in the 1970s uh, as well. So different communist states, although China is becoming more, I think, more of a capitalist type state, but their government's still pretty much considered, I guess, communist overall. Uh, later, uh, in, you know, because of what happened with, with the Cold War, uh, and also because of the influence of, of Karl Marx as well, uh, you do have, of course, the development of social democracy. Social democracy will kind of reject all these communist socialist ideas that uh, were popular in Europe, especially in Eastern Europe. And uh, social democracy is really a capitalist type economy, a, like a mixed economy uh, that has a lot of social programs uh, that are embraced uh, within it. It's more of a fair market economy and that's really what more or less a lot of European countries go to later uh, rather than, say, like communism. So most of Europe is a capitalist. They have capitalist economies uh, pretty much. Uh, but they have a lot of, um, you know, social programs that are part of that, which help to make people equal uh, within an actual capitalist market, uh, more or less. Uh, the United States is more of a capitalist country. You know, like our, our country, uh, more or less. Uh, but uh, ours is more like, I think, what they call it, welfare capitalism. I think is sometimes what they also call it uh, as well. So anyway, uh, kind of talking about some of the backgrounds of, uh, of socialism, but 
Yeah, because of because of communism, you know, a lot of people have a kind of a bad taste in their mouth <clears throat> when it comes to, you know, socialist ideas, uh, that kind of thing uh, that's being pushed around. But like in the United States, we have like welfare, uh, you know, uh, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid. <clears throat> Those are kind of like forms of socialism that we do have, uh, but deal more with social programs, uh, et cetera. <clears throat> I did have a bunch of questions in here. Uh, <clears throat> I think Natalie's asking about uh, slavery. Uh, would slavery have influenced labor costs? Obviously, because of the cost of buying slaves, uh, that would obviously affect the cost of production of whatever crop they're they're producing, uh, et cetera, uh, as well. So yeah, that, obviously that that's one thing, of course. But slavery would eventually be banned, and so they would have to rely on labor costs. Of course, uh, instead, like about the 19th century, you know, the United States banned slavery 1860s. I think Brazil was one of the last countries to ban slavery, which was in the 1880s uh, as well. What's this about? Unless I'm mistaken, slavery was still going on. This, yeah, yeah, but it was eventually banned, um, you know, by the 1860s to the 1880s, uh, pretty much. And then from there, the workers would begin to unite into unions, which unionism really kind of goes between like the 19th century and the 20th century and uh, i think like in the united states like world war one uh world war two uh, kind of had an effect on making unions more legal uh, more than anything because i know unions before that were considered illegal uh, for a long time uh, melva also had a few things too uh, she was mentioning a few things about uh, General Electric, yeah, I know, yeah, you're right. Lewis Latimer, I think I've heard of him. He, yeah, he did help, of course, Edison invent like the light bulb, which a lot of the early filaments used were were carbon filament, which is interesting about that. Uh, I think they later had tungsten and other types of filament that were used as well uh, in them. George Washington Carver, yeah, he's very important. Uh, the peanut band, I think they called him or something like that. He helped to develop a lot of uh, products like peanuts, sweet potatoes, et cetera, uh, that we use products today uh, as well. Yeah, just talking about Solomon Brown, yeah, and helped also develop the telegraph machine uh, with Morse. Yeah, I think I've heard of him uh, also uh, as well. So, yeah, those are good questions, of course, to ask him out, of course, the uh, Industrial Revolution uh, and all that. If you have any other comments, questions, you can always ask me later, just send me comments, questions, uh, whatever course, on my channel uh, and all that. Uh, if you got a question about the class, you can also email me uh, as well. So that's it for my lecture today. Uh, I know next week I'll be moving on uh, in the 19th century. I'm going to talk about uh, also the um, rise of nationalism. That's going to lead to uh, a lot of countries like Germany, uh, Italy, Italy unifying. So kind of get into that. Then I am going to spend a little time. So I think I've got a little extra time this week. I'm going to kind of talk about imperialism because a lot of the European powers uh, start to imperialize, like colonize like Africa, parts of Asia, Pacific. So I'll kind of spend some time uh, also talking about that uh, as well. Uh, before we go, don't forget, I think you have some uh, assignments that are out there. I know the main assignment we have, uh, the British Empire quiz is going to close tonight. So we need to wrap that one up. Uh, second vocab, I'll leave that open this week uh, for you to kind of, you know, turn that in if you haven't done it yet. And I do have that bonus video quiz I've got out right now for extra credit uh, on the Devil's Island, um, I think, documentary that I gave you to watch uh, that Napoleon III was famous for kind of inventing in South America. So, uh, yeah, take a look at that, that documentary, and uh, that's extra points you could earn toward, of course, semester. So that's it for today. Uh, lecture lot wise. Uh, you have any, like I said, any questions about the class, you just email me, of course, about that. Uh, Y'all have a great week. I know tomorrow there's come some kind of bad weather coming I've never heard about. Uh, but uh, y'all have a great week, and I'll see y'all later on Thursday. I'll, I'll send later announcements out, of course, about that third lecture, of course, on the 19th century uh, Europe. So y'all take care and have a great uh, rest of the week, like I said. <laughs>